Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Um, and this next series of videos, there's going to be several in a row. Um, I'm going to record them all as a single and then we'll break them up. But this is probably the single most important uh, series of videos on my channel. And the reason why I say that is because it's going to cover the confusion about the commonest cause of death in the world right now, certainly in, in the United States and the developed world. Uh, and that is cardiovascular risk and all the conundrums and all the mistakes we've made in this regard. I am a clinically practicing doctor. So uh, what happens is I often get emails from patients. I get a lot of emails, a lot of information from emails and uh, emails from patients. I'm going to read you a few of these to kind of understand the complexity of what we do. And then I'll give you my insights into how I approach a patient visit and what I believe to be the salient features in terms of therapy, treatment, and prevention of cardiovascular risk. So let's go down this pathway. And, and as part of this, I would um, a large part of the work that we're going to talk about is based on my own research. You can see a PhD here, PhD work that I did in the laboratory, and then also two very, very important people out there. One of them is David Diamond, Dr. David Diamond, PhD, not an MD, but heavily vested in the um, lipid space, in the cardiovascular disease lipid space. And then another physician, a, um, a, a doctor who is a Scot, he's from Scotland, he works in Scotland, and um, that is Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. Uh, some of you may know him. This is his book. Uh, it's a book that he sent me. It's called The Clock Thickens. And he wrote this book together with a great friend of mine, um, Dr. Zoe Harkham, who's actually a PhD nutritionist, again, works in Wales, uh, Zoe does. And I had the uh, wonderful occasion of, of hanging out with her recently in, in the UK. And Malcolm and, and um, Zoe are also going to add into this equation, and you'll see some of the correspondence we had with them. So let's start with this. This is a letter from a patient of mine, a guy by the name of Michael. And uh, this is classic types of emails that I get. So it starts like this. Dr. Sivers, I had the CAC score done and my PCP said it looked troubling, but set an appointment for me to see him a month away. So CAC score is done, which I had to order because the, the PCP did not order it. OK, I ordered it, not the PCP. And then he, the PCP gets the result and says, oh, it looks troubling. Let me see you back in a month. <laughs> OK. So Michael goes on to write, thinking that he would probably like me to see a cardiologist, I saw one the next day. They had a cancellation. I saw the cardiologist PA, physician's assistant. She wanted to put me on a statin. So you've got a CAC score equals statin. She wanted me to put me on a statin, receive a statin, 20 milligrams, and asked me point blank why I discontinued my previous statin He'd previously been on simvastatin at 40 milligrams. I told her, from what I've read and studied, biohacker, from what I've read and studied, I didn't think it was necessary. She said, and here's the important thing. This is a PA, cardiologist PA, giving people advice on their heart disease when they're most vulnerable, most vulnerable because they've got a problem with their heart, commonest cause of death. She said she thought Everybody over the age of 18 should be on a statin because the proof, the proof was that people would have a longer life expectancy if they started statin therapy earlier. That is the mindset of this cardiologist and this cardiologist PA stating that, that everybody over the age of 18, and in fact, we're seeing a lot with our pediatric patients as a pediatric surgeon, I see this in the pediatric population, people prescribing statins and lipid lowering drugs for kids, for children, as a monotherapy, as this wonderful way to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. Michael goes on to say, now I've watched your videos, read the meta study, read the meta study, the meta analysis study um, that was also done by uh, uh, several folks in our small group. Um, read the meta analysis study that you referenced by Paul Mason et al concerning LDL and statins. And I came to the conclusion that extending my life by 0.8 of a percent was ridiculous, particularly given the negative side effect pro profile of these statins. The PA, the cardiology uh, physician's assistant, did not want me asking too many questions. 
probably because she didn't know the answers. So I simply took the script and left, smart man. You can't fight these folks, you can't argue with them. So take the script, leave, but every human being out there who is a consent giving adult can decide whether or not they're going to take a medication. If I say don't take it, or if they say take it, it is always your decision, and I'm not gonna demonize you for that. This PA scheduled me for an ultrasound, an echo, 3T, uh, 3MTFHU, MTFHUR, the, the genetic testing. Oh my goodness, you got homocysteine levels are low. I have no idea what those are for. So didn't even get an explanation of what they're testing for, and this person, Michael, is, is coming to me and he says, I need your guidance in this matter. I need your guidance in this matter. Below is the last, work that I, last blood work that I did um, uh, with you. So we discussed this, but here is an email from a patient of mine who went to see the cardiologist and they said everybody over the age of 18 should be on a statin, but would not elaborate on that. Okay, so we'll get back to that in a little bit. The next person is another patient of mine. And this person sends me a note from another cardiologist. Now I'm gonna give this cardiologist name because I'm in praise of this cardiologist. This cardiologist is Eric M. Thorne. I don't know the person at all, okay? Cardiology. And this patient of mine has a primary diagnosis of class three severe obesity with a BMI of 40 to 44. So severely obese, okay? And um, when they assess and plan, they say class three severe obesity with BMI 40 to 49 and adult, un and these are the notes. I'm reading directly from this, um, from this doctor, Dr. Thorne's notes, Thorne MD. Assessment and plan for obesity. Continue ketogenic diet and regular follow-up with a support group. That's our practice. I am increasing Homonjaro dose. I'm not certain I would increase the dose, but Manjaro is a, a GLP-1 agonist in the, in the same line as Ozempic. I'm increasing her Manjaro dose on top of her ketogenic diet to help her to treat her insulin resistance and to help her to lose weight. We reviewed, ha ha, beautiful. This doctor knows, he knows. How many of you on GLP-1s have never been warned about this? We reviewed, we reviewed the potential risk of pancreatitis and we reviewed, re reviewed pancreatitis symptoms and she will seek emergent care in the event she has such symptoms. This doctor, folks, props to you, my friend. Props to you. I am impressed. Very, very impressed, Dr. Thorne. And let me tell you, in addition, why I'm further impressed. Because Dr. Thorne, as a cardiologist, when... Uh, he writes about hyperlipidemia, unspecified hyperlipidemia type. So this patient is also being valued for high bl blood lipids. And his assessment and plan, Dr. Thorne's assessment and plan, lab results from last week show a total cholesterol of 185. Oh my God! LDL of 116. Oh my God, she's going to die of a heart attack in about 10 seconds, according to them. But triglycerides of 73 and HDL of 65. Those are my babies. Those are my true ratios. Triglycerides and HDL. Good HDL, not perfect, but good HDL, low triglycerides, which confirm that she's on a ketogenic diet, confirms that between her diet, her lifestyle, and the Manjaro, she is progressively becoming insulin sensitive. Taken together with other risk factors, says Dr. Thorne, X's risk is low. X's, X's cardiovascular risk is low, and I am not, I am not, I'm a cardiologist, but I'm not recommending lipid lowering therapy. Continue efforts at optimizing her nutrition and weight loss. That, folks, is a really, really good letter. And I'm very, very pleased that that doctor is in our fold. So those are emails that I get on a regular, regular basis. So let's flip this around. Let's look now at the science behind uh, some of this. And this is just, a, we have a, 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 a small group of us 
that communicate with each other all the time. People in the ketogenic space, David Diamond is one of those, Ken Berry is one of those, these are folks that you know. But we talk amongst ourselves because we provide information for each other, we learn amongst ourselves, and then we pass that on to our patients. This is a really, really cool group of about 30 or so providers, all at the rock face. So this is a comment from David Diamond based on some of the, sh the stuff that I've shared with him, those two, those two emails. And David says, I may be accused of being naive, but I would suggest that a provider's obligation is to inform a patient of the benefits and hazards of a treatment. Absolutely right, David. Not to demand a patient take a medication. A provider should inform a patient of the well-established and extensive list of hazards of statins, the questionable link of LDL to, cardio, uh, to cardiovascular disease, and the minuscule benefits of statins which have been overinflated with the use of relative risk instead of absolute risk. It is then up to the patient, and this is the way we practice, it is then up to the patient to decide if he or she is willing to take the medication. The goal of SMHP in a practice such as yours is to give the patient information with which to make an informed decision. And Malcolm Kendrick, who's part of this group as well, says, it is never my decision whether or not a patient takes a particular course of action. I advise, I consult, the patient makes the decision. Exactly what we do in our practice. I would argue that the current situation where benefits of statins are given as relative risks and harms as absolute risks can be considered misinformation, disinformation, that verges on malpractice, and I completely agree. In fact, I added in verges on malpractice on top of what Malcolm, Malcolm said. So, furthermore, in, in summary, studies have found no significant overall mortality benefit with statin therapy in, in low-risk patients, as well as no reduction in the risk of serious illness overall and very small benefits of non-fatal non heart attacks and strokes. Statins also appear to cause diabetes, cognitive dysfunction, liver damage, and musculoskeletal uh, damage. Although this is uncommon, diabetes may occur more often than the prevention of a heart attack or a stroke. Think about that. You're more likely to get diabetes from a statin than you are to prevent a heart attack or a stroke, says Malcolm and says the uh, Nutrition Network. It appears that the existing evidence is in disagreement that statins should be used for patients with a 10-year cardiovascular risk below 20%, with no mortality benefit, no reduction in serious illness, and approximately a 1% chance of avoiding a non-fatal heart attack or a stroke, which is similar uh, or greater chance, with a similar or greater chance of developing diabetes, and a 1 in 21 chance of muscle damage, it seems wiser to focus on local, uh, on local changes, such as adopting a low-carbohydrate diet of one form or another, exercising, lowering your blood pressure, and not smoking, instead of cholesterol drugs in low-risk patients. These individuals should be informed of the known risks and benefits of statins, and the decision to start statin, th statin therapy should be shared by the patient and physician rather than posed by guidelines. Think about what that cardiology PA told the patient. Everybody over the age of 18 should be on a statin. Never elaborated why she thought that. This, folks, is malpractice. Malpractice. You cannot give informed consent to take a medication if you do not understand the risks, the benefits, and the uh, liability and have decision-making uh, choices. The fact that these family doctors and cardiologists are forcing patients and scaring patients into taking these medications is ludicrous, and they're lying to their patients, in part intentionally, but also in part from a naiveness because they don't know the data. They've probably never, ever looked at these studies. So in summary, for those receiving statins, here's the breakdown. There's no statistical, statistical significant mortality benefit to taking a statin. No statistically significant benefit to taking a statin. One in 217 avoid a non-fatal heart attack. One in 313 avoid a non-fatal stroke. However, one in 21 
experience measurable muscle damage. One in 21. So if 100 people take the statins, five, almost five, will have muscle damage. And two, one in 204 develop diabetes. Now, this is not made up data. This is from the same trials that advocate for statin use. Because they use relative risk to tell you statins are good, and they use absolute risk to report side effects. So 217 avoided a non-fatal heart attack. 204 got diabetes. <laughs> and the bizarre part is diabetes is currently the single commonest cause, or insulin resistance is the single commonest cause of cardiovascular disease. The next uh, um, video is going to discuss that in detail and will give you the science behind it. So I think that it is completely ethical to point out information like this, which underestimates harms in my view. I may also point out, now this is, a little, <laughs> this is an interesting, okay, this is probably not what you guys should be hearing, but I'm going to go down this road. Because when it comes to these studies, here's an interesting thing. It may also be, uh, uh, it may also point out that a non-fatal heart attack or a stroke can be said to be mild, so mild, that the patient doesn't even know that they had a stroke or a heart attack. For example, it might just be a little blurriness of, of the mind, or it might have been just a, oh, my chest hurt a little bit, and then it's over. 50% of the time, however, when you're placing stents in people's hearts, there is an elevation in cardiac enzymes. So when these cardiologists are doing interventions on the heart, 50% of the time, the enzymes go up. How do you measure a heart attack? You measure enzymes. So if you come into the ER, oh, my chest hurts, and the doctor does enzymes, and the enzymes are positive, they, that confirms that you had a heart attack because the enzymes come from the breakdown of muscle, of heart muscle. 50% of the time when they place a stent, you are going to have a heart attack because by definition, by definition, a raise in cardiac enzymes is diagnosed as an MI, as a myocardial infarction, as a heart attack. Question is, is this really a non-fatal heart attack? Well, by the numbers it is because if you had the same thing in the ER, they would diagnose it as such. And yep, says Malcolm Kendrick, it is. The irony of this, folks, is that, of course, in so many of the trials on cholesterol-lowering uh, medications, they use the indication. Think about this. So how do you diagnose uh, a problem? A problem. So what they do is they look at plaque disease. So they may use a CAC score, but very often a lot of these trials on cholesterol-lowering drugs use percutaneous coronary, coronary intervention which is where they put a catheter up and they squirt some dye in your heart. So percutaneous, the need, the need to have a PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, as a cardiac cath, as an outcome metric. So they look at the group on statins, they look at the group not on statins, and if you had a, a cardiac catheterization, that is an indication that's a problem. And they look at the statin group, they look at the non-statin group, and if the non-statin group's higher, they, that's how they measure damage because they assume that the damage is there because you're having this intervention. So that is this, however, a, a cardiac cath is not a clinical outcome. It is a clinical decision, widely prone to bias. So you do a cardiac cath on a placebo patient, on a patient not on a statin, who participates in a clinical trial because their cholesterol is high. High cholesterol, oh, you must, have, must be having a heart attack. Let's do a cath on you. And you cause a heart attack. You cause the enzymes to go up. 50% of those interventions, you're going to have a heart attack. Unimportant clinically for the most part. Then you claim that cholesterol lowering reduces MIs because fewer people in the statin group are having these interventions and more of the people in the cholesterol group are having these interventions. And then you claim that the number of interventions is lower in the statin group. Yeah, I know, I know that the participant should be censored after the first event. But all the follow-up papers ignore that. So if you've had that event, you should be removed from the trial. But the papers ignore that. So you create a heart attacks in the placebo group because of intervention, and then claim the intervention with a statin is wonderful. <sighs> anyway, I just that's how upside down this is, and that's what we physicians have to think about when we're making recommendations. And that's problematic, folks. That's very, very problematic for me. So, I, 
here's a, a simple way, because I, I, I can't claim to know all the answers. But on a global scale, I simply see cardiovascular disease as a process of damage and repair. So think about this, folks. Your blood vessels have got blood flowing in them all the time. And there's continuously things that cause a bit of inflammation and things that reduce inflammation. And the human body is very adept at internal repair. When there's damage, it's got a way to contain the damage. You contain the damage, which is the clotting system in the blood vessels. And then once the damage is contained and smoothed out, you've got a way to break down that clot. And that is happening continuously in our bodies. The, the human body is one of the major construction zones of anything out there. You look around now in this construction boom of housing, it is pathetically small relative to the construction demolition that's happening continuously in the human body. One of the next videos is going to come down to this. So on a global scale, cardiovascular disease is simply a process where damage, the frequency and the intensity of damage outweighs the body's ability to repair it. That, the consequence of that ratio that, that favors damage to repair is the increase in cardiovascular disease. If damage is greater than, the repair, than repair, the outcome is eventually on a chronic basis that plaque develops. If repair is better than damage, then plaque does not uh, uh, develop. And soft plaque may even regress. And it's difficult to find a single factor that causes this. However, there are four factors that we absolutely 100%, and I don't say 100% often in science, 100% contribute to plaque that favor damage greater than repair. The first one, smoking. And actually, I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to put that as the second one now, because smoking is the classic one, nicotine. And we'll talk about the mechanism in a few minutes in the next talk. However, the first one now that is now dominating nicotine is hyperglycemia, high, chronically high blood sugar levels and spiking blood sugar levels. Hyperglycemia, hypertension, high blood pressure, high blood pressure, although alone unlikely to cause a problem, but hypertension with nicotine, hypertension with hyperglycemia, absolutely. And I know this is a vague one. But stress, the stress hormones, the adrenergic stress hormones. So if you're living in a high stress environment, and it's actually the adrenergic hormones, the adrenaline, the dopamine, the noradrenaline, that are more important than cortisol. And David Diamond will tell you that cortisol is there to bring down, bring down to reverse the effects of, stre of the stress hormones. But it's the stress hormones. And those are the four areas that uh, that are the, in the mix for increasing damage over repair and add smoking to high blood pressure to raise blood sugar to a stressful life and a poorly managed stressful life you've got the classic four diseases that are responsible for cardiovascular risk and that's it that is it. There's actually, interestingly, only two conditions, two conditions that cause severe atherosclerosis without anything else playing a part. So this is just an anecdote. It doesn't matter to most of us, most of us but it's important to check. Number one, the classic is sickle cell disease, and that's a genetic abnormality. Number two is autoimmune disease, specifically and particularly lupus, lupus disease. So in my practice, we fairly commonly do do autoantibodies. We look for rheumatoid disease, we look for Sjogren's, we look for myelodysplastic disease, and we look for lupus factors. We do the rheumatoid factor, we do the ANA, we look for factors of inflammation because of the risk of cardiovascular disease. And those two independently will increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Otherwise, it's those other things that we do to ourselves. So there's some genetics, but the dominant ones are things that we do to ourselves. The carbohydrates, the nicotine, the hypertension, the failure of stress management. And if you add those all together, that's the soup that we live in. 
And what's the answer? The answer is to treat carbohydrate addiction, to not smoke and to treat carbohydrate addiction. And car the treatment of carbohydrate addiction involves two major aspects. Number one, a shift from a glucose, hyperglycemic glucose-based diet, a carbohydrate-based diet, to a fat-based diet and getting in ketosis with normalization of insulin resistance. And the second one is when you remove carbohydrates as a source of emotion management, to replace their role in your life with an effort-based emotion management system to help you to treat stress, anxiety, depression, anger, fear, frustration, boredom, and pleasure, collectively called emotional tension. And that's what we do, folks. That's what we do. We are heavily ketogenic-based, so we help you from a dietary perspective to develop a, 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 a low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic diet so that you're in ketosis. And to understand that carbohydrates have become your stress management system, carbohydrate snacking and binge eating, and to replace those by slowly developing a more effective stress management system, one that lower your blood pressure, that is an effort-based emotion management system. And if you go back and you look at my CHESS, C-H-E-S-S video a few months ago, that explains the stress management system. That, folks is the way to avoid, prevent, or reverse, or stabilize cardiovascular disease, not taking medication. Medication may help early on, and some of the next videos are going to explore the role of medication, indications, that kind of thing. I hope this has made you think. I hope this has given you insights. I hope you now have a better idea of looking at different physicians practicing in the same arena, and they are good ones, and they are not so good ones. Please make sure that you take advice from someone you can trust and someone who is willing to sit down and explain benefits and risks and consequences of each approach to you, because you need to be informed to make the best decision for yourself. I am the Carb Addiction Doc, and follow up with the next video, we're going to go through some of the mechanisms of this, and then the final video in this series is going to talk about best practices in my opinion.